Okay, I think it's about time to start. Uh, thank you everyone for coming back for even more LAMPs with me. Uh, I really appreciate it. Uh, today we're going to be delving a bit deeper into LAMPs, talking about how to run it on Archer. We weren't able to last time because obviously Archer was down. Uh, I'm going to be also talking about how to compile it. I will be explaining how to compile it on Archer, but the compilation is very similar on your own laptops or even your own clusters. Uh, and I'll explain how it's different if you guys want. I will also be talking about uh, compiling on GPUs because there was some interest in that. And other than that, I think there's probably going to be a bit more detail about the main decomposition, why it's good, why it isn't. Well, actually, mainly why it's good. Um, and also, I will be discussing how to actually go in and change some of the LAMP's uh, source code. Uh, as always, if you want to uh, ask me any questions, feel free to do it either on the group chat or by private message if you'd rather not have the question attributed to you. Before we get started, John has asked uh, if I could explain the how what neighbor lists are very quickly and why you might want to use them. So basically, um, molecular dynamic simulations you are usually simulations that involve thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of particles. And a lot of these particles are freely moving and sometimes you will put restraints on them. You might put bonds between a couple of them, angles between a couple of them. If you're modeling, say, a large molecule, then there will be angles, you know, there will be bonds and angles keeping certain particles in place within that molecule. But still, there will be a lot of movement of all of these particles. Uh, in this case, I'm talking very atomic, so let's call them atoms for now. Uh, part of the updating of your, like, part, part of the way that you propagate your system through time is, uh, start, if you remember, starting with all of your particle positions, all your particle velocities, and all your particle forces and energies, you would then move forward a tiny bit in time, assuming that the atoms would travel at a constant velocity to a new position for a small enough time step. Um, you would move your atoms forward in time. From there, you would, uh, you would then recalculate your energies and your forces, and from that, you would recalculate your velocities to then move your, part, your system forward in time a bit, find out your new position, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, quite often, uh, most, not all, but most commonly used potentials are uh, pairwise potentials, i.e., they are potentials between uh, pairs of particles. So the way that you calculate your energy and thereby your forces is uh, you look at every single possible pair particle within your system and calculate what the energy from atom I is on every other atom J. And uh, for small systems, say for a system of 100, 1,000, even 10,000 particles, that's not, that doesn't take too long. But as soon as you have larger systems, once you reach the hundreds of thousands, once you reach even the you know the halves of millions, the millions, etc., uh, you're starting to look at needing to calculate uh, potentials and interactions between n squared over two different particles, where n is the number of particles in your system, uh, uh, different particle interactions, where n is the number of particles in your system, uh, and this can get very costly, and it does get very costly. So one of the ways to not have to do this many calculations is to consider only the close neighbors of a given atom, of a given particle. I use those words interchangeably. I'm really sorry about that. I will try to get on, you know, get on top of that. But, uh, but yeah, so, so to reduce that, what you say is instead of considering every particle in space, let's only consider the neighbors that are within a smaller cutoff for every single particle. So then instead of doing n squared time, um, like for every particle, instead of having n interactions that you need to calculate, you now might need to calculate, say, I don't know, 1,000 or 10,000, which is way less than n. So that greatly reduces the number of uh, interactions of a, that you need to calculate, which greatly reduces the number of computation steps that you need to make, which reduces the amount of time your program takes. Um, and so a neighbor list really is just a list of uh, particles that um, 
a neighbor list is a list of particles that are within a set cutoff that is larger usually than your interaction cutoff, where you will only consider those particles when calculating energies, and you will update this neighbor list every few time steps. So I've got a follow-up question, which is, can you create different neighbor lists for different interactions in the same simulation? For example, uh, LJ interactions are much smaller than electrostatics. So for that one, in LAMPS, yes, you can. Uh, LAMPS has uh, LAMPS has different methods of calculating electrostatic interactions. I'm not going to delve too much into electrostatic interactions because I'm not entirely sure how much, uh, like it, it's something that is very specific to atomic simulations and I'm aware that there are people who come from a non-atomic background who don't need as many as much uh, to use electrostatic interactions. But basically the method for calculating electrostatic interactions is a method, um, it's a variation on uh, what's called EWOL sums, where, um, where basically you sort of consider all electrostatics in your simulation box in uh, reverse Fourier space, uh, like reverse Fourier um, position space. And from that, you're essentially able to get much, much, much longer ranged interactions calculated quite quickly because because you're in reverse for your space, everything is periodic, which means that you can sort of like get a lot more information a lot more quickly. Uh, so in LAMPS, definitely you can use um, electrostatic interactions, which are incredibly long ranged, while still having a Leonard Jones short ranged interaction, which has a cutoff and still have a neighbor list. For the Leonard Jones interaction, you will only calculate based on the neighbor list. For the electrostatic interactions, you will use these uh, EWOL summation methods, or uh, the other one they have is particle, particle, particle mesh method, which is a variation on EWOL summations in order to calculate all of the electrostatics. Um, I hope that answers the question. And with that, uh, let's get on with today's session. Today's session uh, is we're going to start. I'm going to quickly, quickly go through the exercise problem that I set and give a really brief uh, solution. I realize most of you probably haven't done it, and most of you will already know this, but it's in case there's a couple of you who have done it over the week, just to see what you were aiming for, what you should have gotten as an answer, more or less, and to explain the science behind it. Uh, then I'm going to go straight into uh, Lamps on Archer. I'm going to teach you how to run Lamps on Archer. I'm going to talk a lot more about domain decomposition. I hinted at it last week, but basically domain decomposition is very important for any parallel processing. Um, and then we're going to probably, I'm not sure where the short break will be. It'll probably be in the middle of me talking about compiling lamps on Archer, but at around 3, 10 past 3, we'll take a short break, uh, come back at half past, past 3, and somewhere around that break I will be talking about how to compile lamps on Archer. I'll make sure to tell you the differences between compiling on Archer versus compiling on your home system or whatever. Uh, I'll also talk about GPU compilation. We'll, we'll have a short break and then I will show you how, I'll show you in real time, it'll probably go terribly wrong but I've got hope, I will show you how to alter lamp source code to try to add things to it to maybe remove things from it to get the force fields that you guys want, or the fixes, or the pair styles, or whatever. Um, we'll finish with whatever questions. Uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll be taking questions as I go as I see them. If I don't see them, I'll definitely look at all questions during the short break, answer them when we come back from the short break, and I'll answer them at the end of the session. Uh, as I said before, for questions, feel free to put them on the general chat or direct message me. Cool. So. The solutions to the exercise problem. Basically, I said um, try to run the LAMPS uh, input script, the simple LAMPS input script that I gave you guys last week, which is a simple Leonard Jones fluid with fixed number of particles, the number of particles was uh, 1,000, fixed volume, uh, and fixed uh, temperature. The temperature was uh, 1 for a reduced temperature. And uh, basically, we were varying the density, which varies the volume, obvious, uh, which varies the volume. But yeah, the idea was what happens as you vary the density, and specifically what happens to your radial distribution function. 
So here I've plotted the three radial distribution functions for three densities that I suggested you guys look at. Uh, density of 0.05, this is number density, by the way. Uh, so it's number of particles divided by total volume of the box, where the volume is calculated in particle radii. Um, so at a density of 0.05, you get a peak at around 1, you get a peak at around 1.12. And then the, from that peak, you get an exponential decay tending to a radial distribution function value of 1. Uh, this is because the system is in a gas state at this point. So if you look at the, I just literally took the final frame of the positions video from that example. And if you look at just the positions at the end of the simulation, you can see it's a gas. There's loads of gaps in there. There's loads of... Uh, space in there, few particles in the box is big. Bear in mind when comparing the picture sizes that uh, I've kept the particle radii fixed, meaning that if the particles look smaller in the left-hand box and larger in the right-hand box, it is not that I've increased the size, it is that the box has reduced in size. So loads of gaps, it's a gas, and this is what you'd expect from a radial distribution of a gas. Essentially, very quickly, you like remember the radial distribution function is giving you an idea of the variations around uh, how much your system varies in density as you go further and further away from a central particle. And uh, those variations are normalized by the average density of your system. Uh, so you would expect it to be at one very quickly, and it is. Next, if you increase your density to 0.8, you get uh, this lovely peak at again 1.12, and then you get another peak at around 2-ish, two, 2 to 2.2, uh, and then you get a third peak, and you roughly get a peak every, uh, every sigma. And the reason for this is that at 0.8, you are in a liquid state. Um, your, your system is a liquid, or close enough, and um, and yeah, essentially, this is your classical uh, liquid radial distribution function, where you get uh, you get shells of atoms forming around each individual atoms, but those shells have no structure. They have no long-ranged order, nothing like that. It's not quite a solid. It's not quite a gas. It's somewhere in the middle. That's what you'd expect to see. And uh, again, if you look at the simulation box, you'll notice that there's the particles are a lot more packed in there, but there's still some gaps. There's not as many gaps between all particles, but they are still there are still, I mean, bubbles if you want to call them that, spaces where no particles happen, and stuff like that. And then the last one we've got is uh, p equals 1.4. This is a very high uh, density. That that should be rho. I'll change that. Uh, this is a very high density, and uh, yeah, basically here you've got structure. So essentially, you can see that there's peaks and repeated peaks and very definitive peaks, and it doesn't seem to tend to one quite necessarily as quickly as the other two. That's what you'd expect from a radial distribution of a of a um, of a solid. And here, if you look, uh, it's kind of hard to tell, but actually, you do have structure. All of your particles are sort of lined up in. Um, a nice structure. This is maybe not the best picture, but trust me on this, according to the radial distribution function, it's solid or solidish. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention, and I'll quickly post this in chat, everything that I'm going to talk about, the slides, uh, the lamps input codes, and other stuff that I will be talking about and using, you can find in on the Archer training website. I've just posted a link in the chat. If you want to follow along rather than looking at my slides, feel free to go download them from there. So that's the example solutions. And uh, now let's move on to running lamps on Archer. Uh, so very quickly, what is Archer? Archer is the UK's national supercomputer. Uh, part, of the region, part of the reason that I'm pitching it is because we at EPCC, amongst other things, run Archer. We try to make sure it works, and we um, we, we, we make sure it works, we install things, we help users, all that sort of thing. So it seems sensible for us to, at least at some point, mention Archer. Also, this is a specifically Archer course, so let's talk about Archer for a second. Uh, the way Archer works is that it uses a... Um, uh, there is a pre-installed version of LAMPS as a module. So a uh, module on, on Archer, if you want 
any specific package, you need to load a module for that. I'll show you how to do it very briefly. But there is already pre-installed on Archer a version of LAMPS, which, um, which you can just, just get and use. Uh, the other thing is Archer is a computer cl cluster. Uh, it allows you to, like when you log into Archer, you log into one of the uh, login nodes. And from those login nodes, you can run short serial jobs, though we'd rather you didn't, uh, or you can submit parallel jobs. The login nodes cannot, uh, cannot run parallel jobs. So uh, you, where was I? Yeah. So uh, you can run parallel jobs by submitting a job. I'll be showing you how to submit these jobs. Uh, when you submit the job, you need to, uh, you need to submit it to one of our many nodes. I think we have, I can't remember, I think it's a lot of nodes. I think it's about 4,000, but I might be wrong. Um, but yeah, so, so you submit it to one of the nodes, and part of the things about Archer is when you submit a job, you need to ask for an entire node. Each node has 24 processors. Each processor is way better than the processors on my laptop, makes sense, uh, which means that simulations run very quickly. And um, yeah, so when you submit a job to Archer, you need the following things. You need to make sure that you've got the right modules loaded. You need to have submitted it to, uh, submitted the job to a backend node. Uh, you need to have considered the number of processors that you're using on each node. And uh, you need to assign a runtime. So without further ado, let's move on to, um, Let's move back into Shell. By the way, I'm really sorry about this, but there will be a lot of looking at things in Shell today because quite a lot of what we're doing is Shell dependent. Um, yeah, so let's move into Shell. And here I'm in the wrong directory. Yeah, so here I'm in the directory for today. Uh, there. You, you can access most of the stuff that I'll be using today. I'm essentially going to run exactly the same uh, job that I ran last week, but on Archer instead, because I wasn't able to show you guys. But so, so this is just a repeat of what we did last week, except on a bigger computer. So here we've got the in.leonardjones file in.lj, and we've got the LAMPS submission script for submitting a job on Archer. So um, if we look at this submission script, here you've got your general submission script. At the top, you've got the name of your job. It is, uh, this job will be run on Archer as LJ underscore exercise. Next, you've got here the command for uh, selecting the number of nodes you want. I have asked for a single node. I'll get to that. I'll get to why only a single node in a second. Here, I've added an optional command to ask that this gets run on the short queue so that it's more likely to run faster. And here, uh, I have defined the amount of time that I want to use uh, on Archer. Uh, the amount of time is zero hours, five minutes, zero seconds. So I will have a maximum time of roughly five minutes in which my job needs to complete. Here is the budget code. Everyone who is on this course should have this budget code with the associated login. And you should all be able to run on Archer using this, login uh, this budget code uh, the budget code is Y14 maps. If you want to run some of the things that I'm talking about, if you want to try them on Archer, you're welcome to use Y14 lamps as a budget code to run on there. There is some attributed budget to allow everyone to do that, and we have not even made a dent in it. Uh, that's my fault. I should have been more ambitious in terms of the size of jobs. Uh, here, this, these lines just say, make sure that my working, my present directory on Archer is the same as, uh, sorry, on the backend nodes is the same as on the login nodes. And last, these bits I changed, I can't remember why. Oh, it was to test a couple of things. Module load lamps. And this should change as well. Hopefully this will run. I'm always worried about changing things online, but then I'll need to do that a lot more of this stuff afterwards. XC30. There we go. So, 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 sorry about that. Uh, here I am calling the module that we need to load. I am telling the backend node, if you've not done so already, load 
this module, and this module is called LAMPS, and I want specifically the LAMPS version 11th of May 2018, the latest that Archer has. Um, and next we have our run. So as I said before, uh, sorry. so to start off with, AP run is just Archer's version of MPI run. It's, it's to run a multiprocessor job using uh, not quite MPI libraries, but similar. Minus N24, I am going to run this job on 24 cores. I asked up here for one node. Each node has 24 cores. Let's make use of all of them. LMP XC30, that's just the name of the lamps executable that I'm going to run. Minus in in.lj, that's my input script. And then I will send everything I output to a file called out.output. That's that. Uh, again, I mentioned a uh, LAMPS module. If you want to load a module with LAMPS, you just module load and you can uh, autocomplete. I'm getting a couple of questions. Uh, so, uh, I'm on the day two material and I'm not seeing all these files. That is correct. The files that I am using are copied from the day one materials folder. They're exactly the same as the day one's material folder. I just put them in the day two folder so that I don't need to move around too much. Uh, do I have to compile the make file first? No, you do not, because uh, at the moment you are running the Archer version of LAMPS. You are not running your own version of LAMPS on Archer. It's it's a bit diff it's a bit of a weird statement to make, but basically um, the like we at EPCC pre-compile a lot of libraries so that you don't have to. So for instance, if I type module load lamps, auto completes, I can double tap to show all version of lamps. There we go. So that's all of the version of lamps that are available already pre-compiled on Archer. If instead I wanted to run, say, something like CP2K, which is a um, CP2K is a density functional theory problem. It's also it's, it's a quantum mechanics atomistic problem, basically. But yeah, again, for that one, here are all the available libraries of um, CP2K. And then you can check all of the available uh, modules by typing module avail. And that is a list of every single module available in LAMPS, including things like OpenFOAM, Espresso, a bunch of other programs, and even some, uh, like, yeah, that is there. Oh, cool. Uh, and there's even a couple of uh, things for people who want to develop code and check code, you know, like compile programs and things like that, which we'll do at some point in the next couple of hours. Uh, uh, and all of that information is on the group chat if anyone wants to do it. So where were we? We were looking at our LAMP submission script, and I sort of talked you through it. So now how do you submit it? Well, it's relatively simple. You queue sub for submitting to sub, submit the job to the queue, lamps. And then if you queue start, it will show you that you that I currently have a job. This is the ID number. So if I wanted to delete the job, that's the job I'd want to delete. The user who's running this job is JSON. Uh, it's in the queue as this number. Uh, it's in the queue as this number. The name of the job is lamps uh, LJ exercise. Number of nodes asked for one tasks 24. It's requiring five minutes. It's already running because, you know, sometimes things are awesome and things run straight away. And it's been running for zero seconds because I'm not currently watching it. This is an incredibly short, small simulation to run on Archer. So in the time that it took me to explain all of this, the job's already run. And uh, hey, it worked. So here, whereas before we only had in.lj and lamps sub.pbs, we now have four new files. The first one, lj exercise.e with the job number. This number is exactly the same. The, the number 6595383 is exactly the same as the job ID we had before. Um, that tells you if there's any errors that are output by the node, you get them in this file, which really helps you to debug things. Uh, the output.out file, that was where I was sending all of my outputs to screen. Log.lamps is my, log, uh, my lamps log file. 
And last, we've got the ljexercise.output. That will be pretty much exactly the same as output.out. It's everything that got printed to screen. So let's look at our output file. And here we have, uh, for those of you who were here last week, exactly the same thing as last week. It, it looks exactly the same. It is exactly the same. It's just been run on a much better computer than my laptop. One really interesting thing that I want to stress is this. At the very end of the program, it tells you how long this job took to run. And if you remember, I was able to talk for a decent amount of time while the job was running last week. This ran on 24 processors, admittedly, as opposed to the four processors on my laptop, in five seconds. The other thing that I really want to emphasize is that here, if we look at this line where it breaks up um, where the time was spent, the final column tells you what percentage of time was done calculating what. The first one is how long did we spend calculating pair styles, which, as I said before, takes ages. It's usually the biggest part of your simulation. And we've spent 42%, roughly. Neighbors lists took about 9% of the time. But here, this is the big one. Our communication time is the biggest, by far, amount of time. We took 42% of our time uh, communicating between all of the cores rather than uh, calculating things. And uh, why is that? Well, it all comes down to essentially to demanding composition. Uh, and with that, let's swap back to the slides so that I can talk briefly about domain decomposition. So, domain decomposition. We've got our simulation here on the left-hand side, and we want to run it on a number of processors. Let's say we want to run it on four processors. The way that LAMPS does this, and the way that actually quite a lot of programs do this, is they say, okay, well, let's share the job, let's share the work between those four processors. Now, because molecular dynamics is a very spatial, um, a very spatial thing, like because essentially you are simulating particles in space, the way LAMPS splits that by default is by uh, saying, well, okay, I will make sure that every one of my processors does uh, only cares about the particles and only follows the particles in its region in space. So I will split my region into four equal bits. So in this case, I have split my region into four equal bits. And uh, the first processor might take the upper left-hand corner, the second one the upper right-hand, lower left-hand for the third one, lower right-hand for the right for, for the fourth one. And that's how LAMPS would split this system in um, uh, on four cores. Now, uh, this is uh, there's a couple of things to bear in mind because while you're while processor one is only looking at that upper left-hand corner and all of the particles in that upper left-hand corner, some of those particles in that upper left-hand corner will have interactions with particles from the other processor's regions. And to calculate, uh, to calculate all of your forces and all of your energies and things like that, you will need information from the other processors. And for that, you will need, your, you will need to ask the other processors, you know, hey, could you send me the information for the position of this particle in my neighbor list? And the other processor will need to answer, sure thing, here you go. And that communication time is, uh, is the thing that's quite important to reduce when you're doing large jobs or jobs on a large number of cores. Basically, there is a cutoff at which the speed up that you get by splitting your simulation into a bunch of smaller simulation boxes is outweighed by the cost that you that you have from having to send information back and forth between processors. Now, last week, even though it took ages, even though it was on a crappy laptop uh, processor, last week uh, we were only doing four four core uh, parallelization. We were only using four cores, and our system was nicely divided like like this. Um, the communication time was small. But here, we're using Archer. And Archer nodes, as I said, have 24 cores. And the way that Archer will split um, its space is one dimension will be split into four bits, another will be split into three bits, another will be split into two bits, and every single block will be assigned to a processor. Here, uh, we're only simulating 1,000 particles. Uh, if you remember last week, uh, our simulation box has 1,000 particles. 
which means that every processor is roughly getting about 40. Uh, 40 times 25 is still 1,000 if I can do months. Yes, close enough, anyways. But yeah, so we're getting, so we're roughly on 40. Uh, so, so 40 particles per, per, uh, sorry. So 40 particles per core means that uh, quite often in, within the neighbor list, you're going to have more than 40 particles, which means that most of your time is going to be spent asking all of the other cores, hey, which core has this particle that I'm interested in because it's in my neighbor list? Oh, I do. Here's the information. And that communication time is expensive. We could actually make code run faster on lamps if we reduce the number. Uh, Sorry, we could run this program faster on Archer for exactly the same setup by reducing the number of nodes, uh, of cores that we're using. Uh, but frankly, the communication cost here is actually so low because the program is so small that um, I didn't bother. You can play around with that if you want, you know, challenge to the listeners. So, okay. Uh, one of the issues that comes up with domain decomposition, or the way that, uh, that, that LAMPS handles domain decomposition, is that what happens if your, um, if your system is not evenly distributed? Here I've got a nicely evenly distributed system, and roughly speaking, every single quarter that I've divided my system into has the same number of particles, give or take one or two percent. What if I don't? What if I have a much more uh, a much different system. The, well, you know, let's say we've got this system here where about two thirds of our system size is just empty. And we've got a bunch of particles just around the uh, left hand and bottom side. So, what do we do there? Naively, at the start, the default option for lamps is well, I'm still going to split my space into even blocks. So here we've got 16 processors. I will still split my space into 16 equal squares. Uh, this is non-optimal. The four bottom processors, the ones with the red, white, green, and blue atoms, uh, they will be doing much, much, much more work than the upper right-hand corner of uh, the simulation box. And so, So how do you fix that? Well, LAMPS has a command called balance. And it's actually got two commands called balance. One of them is a fix, and one of them is not. Uh, and the way balance works is it allows you to define how you want to split up your, um, you, the amount of work that each processor does. And roughly speaking, there's two main balance commands. You can either use the normal balance without having a command which does the which, which creates the picture on the left you can use a shift balance command which is still a grid type balance command and will give you the picture in the middle or you can use the rcb i can't remember off the top of my head what those initials stand for but i can look that up in a sec the rcb command which is a tiling command what do i mean by grid type versus tiling to start off with well grid type the idea is you're still splitting your um, system evenly throughout every dimension. So if I'm splitting my uh, in space, so if I'm splitting my this, uh, so so if you take the middle picture and the uh, left hand side picture, both of them have a grid type system. I.e., there is a grid that is formed. Each cell in the grid might have a different size, but every grid point is um, along the same line. Whereas uh, for the right-hand side, we've got a tiling, uh, a tiling type command where we no longer have a grid. So there is no nice straight line through the system. There's a couple of them, but there isn't nice straight lines through the, through the system. Uh, you'll notice that uh, the way that the shift balance works is it's still a grid type, but it's sort of changed the position of the grids to try to even out the number of particles per processor but there's still a couple of particles that have uh, uh, processors that have no particles. The RCB balance type, uh, on the other hand, has uh, tried to make, essentially it's tried to make regions that make sense to the computer but not necessarily to us straight away, such that 
uh, each processor has the same number of particles. If each processor has the same number of particles, each processor needs to roughly do the same amount of work, which means that you will be making your system go optimally. Uh, RCB, thank you very much. Uh, stands for recursive coordinate bisection. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, yeah, so, so that's your grid type versus tiling type. And uh, a couple of other things to talk about this command. There are two ways of doing this in uh, LAPS. You can either just use the normal balance command and say balance, define your number, you know, define the balance type, define whether it's a shift or a RCB or normal. Uh, define your parameters. One of the parameters for RCB definitely is how much variation are you allowing per processor? Obviously, if you're going to try to change your processor domain sizes, if you're going to try to change the amount of space that each processor has such that they have the same number of particles, you can go for ages just spending computational time trying to get it exactly right. Uh, one of the things for RCB is you define how close to right you're happy for your system to get. Uh, so you could say that I'm happy for each processor to have the same number of particles plus or minus 5%. And that plus or minus 5% will allow you to reach that, uh, to finish that computation faster, which will, in the long term, save you time as well. Uh, and things like that. And then LAMPS will do that in the background only before the first time step, or only when you have invoked that command. The fix balance command, on the other hand, is a command where you set a time step, and every this many time steps, you will do the balance command, which means that you will be rebalancing your system. Why would you use either of those? Well, if you're looking at uh, a system that, say you're looking at a gas that uh, condenses into a liquid, the condensation means that uh, particles will take up a smaller volume in space. And that smaller volume will, like because they will take up that smaller volume, uh, there will be more free space, more empty space, or more space with hardly any particles in it. Uh, so rebalancing for that is a good idea. Now, if you're trying to look at specifically this condensation effect, you will want to rebalance over time than just at the start of your simulation because uh, the condensation, you don't know when it will happen and you want to still make sure that you're getting the most out of your processors. If, however, you've got a system like this one where actually this looks like, you know, the ones on the pictures, they look like a solid, they, those particles don't look like they're really going anywhere. I'm not quite sure what the simulation is for. It's just pictures to demonstrate. But if your particles aren't really going to move that much, then maybe having just a balance command at the start will save you all of those iterations of redistributing your particles between your um, processors. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that if you are using a tiling um, style uh, balance command, you will need to set your uh, communication style. There is a com style uh, command in LAMPS, which is just like every other command in LAMPS. You just add it into your uh, you add it into your input script in the right place, and it'll be happy. In this case, it'll need to come before your balance command, and essentially, you just say com style. You it assumes it's brick unless you tell it it's tiled. So say tiled, and everything is good. That's Domain decomposition, uh, domain decomposition. I will manage that word, and uh, the balance command. Uh, this is a lot to take in. So at this point, are there any questions, or am I okay to keep going? Uh, we'll keep going to compiling lamps on Archer. And I'm sorry again, guys. I will get those two words mixed up. I will try to stay on top of that. Uh, compiling lamps on Archer is basically here's all the steps you need to do it. I've shown you two ways of doing it. You can either uh, compile using the make command or compile using CMake. First of all, let's start with how do you get Archer? Uh, how do you get lumps on Archer even? Uh, I will just be doing this in shell. I'm doing the steps on the slides in shell for just, just to show you guys. Uh, the first step is you need to uh, download lumps. See, I'm, I'm going to do this most of the afternoon. I'm really sorry. Uh, the way that you download LAMPS is you just clone it, is probably your easiest way. So. Uh, 
There we go. Uh, I've got a pre-compiled version of LAMPS. That, that's, you'll notice that quite a lot of this takes time. I don't want to spend ages waiting for something to download. So I'm just going to show you the steps. Uh, so first thing is uh, you want to clone LAMPS. And uh, the way you do that is you get clone it from github.com slash LAMPS slash LAMPS. Get. If this doesn't work, I'm just copying and pasting. There we go. And it'll start receiving objects and all of that, and it'll take a decent amount of time, so let's stop that. Uh, it will it will clone everything into a directory called LAMPS. So essentially, after you've get cloned, you'll have a directory called LAMPS, which will actually have things in it, as opposed to this one, which is empty, which I've just made for comparison's sake. But if I'd waited out the git cloning time, I would have that directory called LAMPS filled with everything which is in here. And we have all of these files. Um, these files are, uh, so what have we got? We've got interesting files for you guys are, uh, the first one is the SRC file. The SRC file we will be delving into quite a lot. That is where all of the LAMP source code is. And indeed it's where you need to go if you want to make LAMPs using the make command. Uh, we've got a couple of Python libraries for people who like Python. We've got some further libraries for some user modules that you might want to add. More on that in a second. There are a bunch of example problems that you can do on LAMPS. There's a CMake directory for if you want to CMake, and there's a benchmarking, some tools, loads of stuff. I've actually, to be honest, not really been in the potentials or the benchmarking document. Um, yeah, I've never been into potentials or benchmarking ever. So, you know, there, there's still loads of lamps that I've not even seen, to be fair. Uh, so, let's start with uh, how to make lamps using the make command. If you go uh, from your lamps directory, if you go into the source directory, on Archer, you will need the following things. First of all, you will need to copy the make file um, that I've provided into this. Um, The first thing you'll need is you'll need to copy the make file into the correct directory. The make file I have provided for you guys, um, you should find it in um, slash work slash y14 lamps, oh, sorry, shared, shared lamps workshop. You will notice that in lamps workshop, I have put all of the material from day one and from day two. Uh, in day two materials, I've got this make file. And this is just a lamps make file to make lamps on Archer. That, that's all this one is. And you can get it here. There's a couple of other places you can get it on Archer. Um, it's exactly the same one as the one that's uh, that's suggested for the on the Archer lamps compilation website. And you want to copy this file into make slash machines, because this is a machine make file, and just copy it across. Next, you'll need a couple of modules. The first module you'll need is uh, you will need to swap, switch uh, from the Cray environment. This is just a compiling environment. Don't worry too much about it. But essentially, we will be wanting to uh, compile on Intel processors rather than like using the Intel libraries rather than the Cray libraries. Um, we'll also want to use. Um, Let's use switch rather than swap. Uh, we'll also want to use Intel 17.0.3, uh, because that's the newest version, and it's great. We will also need to uh, switch the GCC from the really old 4.8.1 to something more recent, let's say 6.3.0. There we go. And the last thing, very important, we will want to load the fast Fourier transform uh, library. This just allows us to do fast Fourier transforms, which is super useful for any electrostatics. Now, at this point, we have everything we need for lamps, um, everything loaded that we need on Archer for lamps. We've downloaded lamps. Uh, if you look at the moment at the directory, which I've been doing by accident anyways, you'll notice that you get a bunch of uh, C++ and C++ header files. And uh, for the most more astute amongst you, you'll notice that uh, you know, you've know you got something like velocity C++, 
or velocity.h c++ and uh, I'm not going to spend ages looking for this, but if we go to, there we go, pair style, uh, you'll notice that we've got pair style, um, we've got say pair lj cut, which is exactly the pair style we used. So this is, if we were to go into pair lj cut dot c++ and change that file, uh, we would be changing the code that we're running on, provided that we then recompile. So we're here, we've downloaded everything, and how do we now make the code? Well, the easiest way to make the code is just to type make. Hopefully this works. There we go, it's making. Uh, it's not, uh, yeah, I need to explain what I'm making. Make XC30. I will change that on the notes because I don't think I said that. Yeah. So I'll change that for the slides. So we are making lamps and we want to specifically make lamps with the XE30 files. So we press that and then it's going to take a while. I'm not exactly going to let it take ages. I'll just take a second to check whether I've got any questions. Yeah. So as you can see, it takes a while. It takes maybe five, 10 minutes. I don't really want to watch something compile for five to 10 minutes. But uh, believe me, this will compile if I give it the time. And indeed, you can try it. If it doesn't work, feel free to email any of us at, um, uh, at EPCC, and we will help you guys do that. Uh, thank you to Lewis for sending me this command, which looks like it'll shorten my path. Perfect. I now no longer know where I am, but that's beside the point. Uh, yeah, and that's where you should email us. Uh, Claire has highlighted if you want any help on Archer, uh, email us at support.archer.ac.uk. I'm getting a question. Why are you using Intel libraries? Is it a performance-related reason, or is it, uh, or can it only be comp compiled with those? Um, to be honest, I've not really. Th I don't know. I, I'm aware that it, I've never been able to compile lamps with the Cray libraries, uh, but I've never delved too much, too deeply into it. I imagine I should be able to if I really tried. But uh, essentially, I just. When I first compiled LAMPS on Archer, I followed the documentations for LAMPS on Archer, which you can find online at uh, this website, and they suggest using the Intel compilers. I've never asked why. If you're really, if you're interested enough, I'm happy to uh, I'm happy to find out for you to let you know. Does LAMP support uh, provide any support for using machine learning potentials? Uh, I again, I do not know that. Uh, I've never used machine learning potentials. Uh, it appears that there is, uh, but I'll look into that a bit more during the break and give you a better answer after the break. Uh, how is the make file constructed? Sure, I mean, we can definitely look at the make file. Uh, XE30. So uh, what have we got? We're using, uh, we're using the shell. Yeah, we're just using slash bin slash shell. Uh, this is like the way the way this make file will have been constructed is probably exactly the same way that every other make file is constructed. Lamps comes with a certain number of make files. Uh, I've not shown you most of them, so uh, very quickly for those of you who are compiling at home on your own uh, machines rather than um, on Archer, you'd probably want to make MPI. It's not going to be happy because I don't have MPI loaded. Let's not do that. But basically, if you go into the make, you've got make files for uh, LAMPS MPI. You've got make file for if you want a serial version of LAMPS. And if you go into machines, you've got make files for a bunch of different machines and for a bunch of different uh, architectures. And basically, the way that the makefile.xe30, the one that I copied and the only one that I copied into here, uh, was made is you'll probably someone will probably have taken one of these other make files and uh, have altered it so that it works on Archer. Uh, machines make file dot xc30. There we go. Uh, so what have we got? We've got our bin is uh, slash bin slash shell. We're using cc as our flag. Those are the flags. Those are the links. Uh, using dlamps gzip, that's just normal for all lamps. We're using mpitch because that's what lamps will generically use. We're using uh, fftw3, which we loaded the module for that. Um, and 
and that's about it. So there's not exactly much in the make file, frankly. Uh, the only bit that we will have changed in this one is not too sure, actually. I've never looked into this. This is a good question. Uh, this is make slash mission slash security. Hmm. There we go. So there's a fair few differences, actually. Uh, that's just telling you how to do these things. Uh, CC flag is MPICXX for uh, as opposed to just the Intel processor CC flags. You should, um, yeah. Uh, links and libs are a bit different. Again, you're not using MPICXX, instead, you're using CC. Um, that bit's commented out because that's if you're using the old compilers, which we're not. That bit is also for, I believe, older compilers. Uh, again, got rid of that bit, not sure why. Yeah, but there's not much difference in it. It's literally, I think, we looks like we've just changed the Intel, um, the GCC compilers for MPI to just the uh, Intel MPI compilers. Um, hope that answers that. Cool. So, um, where were we? Yes, CMake. Uh, I think I will explain CMake and then we will probably take a quick break. That seems like the best way to do it. So how do you make using CMake? You can also, uh, on Archer, you can also, uh, it's, exa it's nearly the same as using Make. I tend to prefer Make for a reason that we'll get to after the break. But uh, basically, to, you, to make using CMake, you need an extra mon uh, you need to load an extra module on Archer, and that module is CMake. If you've already got um, if you if you're doing this on your own laptops or whatever, on your own systems or whatever, you probably already have CMake installed. Uh, some things are easier to compile on using CMake; other things aren't. Uh, even with LAMPs, there are certain libraries which are harder to compile without CMake than with CMake. And then you make a directory called build within your LAMP directory. And then you go, sorry, build should be here. So here we've got all of our directories. And you'll notice that there is now a newly made build directory. You go into that build directory. And then you see make um, minus PC. You define your compilers as being um, should be equal as being the C, uh, the Intel MPI CC compilers. You want MPI term. You want you want to run in parallel, so you want your MPI library to be on. And then you just CMake CMake, and then it will start hopefully showing something. There we go, it's telling you something. Uh, and it will just keep making this. And this, again, this step take, takes about five minutes. So we're not going to watch it go unless it finishes in the next 30 seconds. Oh, it's not happy. Ah, yes, it's because I've already made the parts of LAMP. So here, this is really useful, actually. Um, because I've already started building a version of LAMPs using make rather than uh, CMake, uh, CMake has recognized that that exists and is telling me here, you've already got something, get rid of it first. So if you just copy that, uh, insert, uh, yeah. uh, I should use smaller paths. If I just go like that, uh, if I... sorry about this. Empty 
the build file, and let's try that again. And yeah, we'll need to like you know give it an extra second just to make sure that it doesn't fail for the same reasons again. Would be embarrassing if it did. It's likely to. Seems happier. And yeah, and that's going to take a decent amount of time. And uh, once all of this has run, uh, still the same error. There we go. So once this is uh, made, which it will do on this turn, I'm sure of it, um, we, uh, once this is made, the only other command you need to do is in this same build directory, you just type make, and then it will start making the, uh, it'll start making lumps for you, start compiling lumps for you. This is the point where it crashed last time. Will we get luckier? It's taking a bit longer. Hey, there we go. So, so yeah, um, I'll leave that running in the background uh, over the break so that you guys can actually trust me that I can compile lamps. Um, sorry about the embarrassing things. If anyone has any questions up to this point, I'm happy to read them over the break, and I will answer them when I come back. Uh, there we go, that's made. And uh, following this, you just type make. And this will take the entire break to run, but essentially it'll be there in the background for those of you who want to make sure uh, that I can actually compile this using CMake. So uh, we left with uh, me compiling LAMPS in the background, and LAMPS is now compiled. Look at that. There's an executable called LMP, which I can now use. There it is in all of its wonder and glory, that is my LAMPS executable with whatever I decided to put into it. More on that in a sec. Uh, very quickly, I will answer the questions that I got before and during the break. Uh, one of the questions I got before the break, which I didn't answer, uh, is does LAMPS provide any support for using machine learning uh, potentials? Uh, so I had a quick Google of this. And I've never done this myself. But uh, definitely, LAMPS uh, supports what it, one of what it claims to be a machine learning potential, which is pair style uh, AGNI. And there's also a couple of uh, uh, machine learning programs which are made so that you can link them and run them through LAMPS. Uh, one of them is AMP, for instance, and there's a couple of others. What was the other one I was looking at? Uh, I think it was DeepMD, which is also uh, linkable to LAMPS, which means that essentially you can link these libraries and run them through LAMPS to get your machine learning potentials. Uh, I hope that answers that question. Uh, one of the questions is uh, related to last week's lecture of how did I choose my time step of uh, 0.005? Uh, how do I know that that's okay in Leonard Jones units? Uh, the, there's two answers to this. There's the honest answer, which is, frankly, I just tried a couple of time steps and saw the one that didn't crash. That, that was the highest and didn't crash. Uh, but you should be able to calculate exactly what time step you need by working out how far your particles can move in that time step with an average velocity of whatever. Uh, you can find your average velocity from your temperature. And you don't want your particles to move much more than about probably I don't know, you probably don't want them to move too far away from uh, their centers of masses. Uh, so yeah, it's sort of, you, you should be able to work out numerically. But in this case, I didn't. I just tried stuff until it didn't uh, break. The numerical way of working this out would be you start from your temperature. From your temperature, you work out your average velocity. From your average velocity, you work out how far your particles would be moving. Your average velocity is if your time step is 1. And then you reduce that so that your particles don't move too far away from their initial position, on average. 
and not too far away from their uh, initial position is a bit of a tricky one. It's very dependent on whether you're in a gas or uh, solid or a liquid, but basically you probably in a liquid, which is kind of the middle state and the one I'm most used to, you probably don't want to move much more than between 10 and 50% of, of a particle diameter. Even not, even the 50% sounds a bit high and risky, but hey, if it doesn't work, your system crashes. I mean, they, and it gives you a lovely, your system crashed, you're losing particles. As soon as you start losing particles, the way you lose particles is because you get too large an overlap. The way too large overlaps, uh, sorry, too large an overlap leads to an enormous energy, which leads to a huge velocity force, which leads to a huge velocity, which means that some of the particles just move way too far in a time step. And the way you get over, uh, like the, um, the way you prevent having too large overlaps between particles is just by reducing your time step. And the error that you get is particles lost. Essentially, you get particles lost. There were X number of particles before. There are now Y is less than X particles. So if you ever get that error, that's, um, that's proof that um, you've, um, your time step is too big, basically. That's, that's usually what that error means. Uh, I hope that answers that question, even though the answer is a bit hand wavy. Uh, and then the other question is, why would you ever want to use CMake rather than Make? And um, that's a good one. I usually may, I usually use Make. Uh, I found on there is one specific case where I found that CMake is better than Make, and that is if you want to install the Python libraries on Archer, then using CMake is slightly better. But we're really not going to delve into that. It's just that some people might prefer CMake, some people might prefer Make. I'm just pointing out that there are both options there and that they produce a similar output. Uh, admittedly, I've only proven that you get an output from using CMake, but, uh, but yeah, you, you, they produce a similar output. Uh, with that, if everyone is happy, let's get going. So we've made our executable um, LMP star, and if we let's copy LMP star to where am I? Uh, let's go one directory higher. Sorry. Run on Archer, and then if we go into run on Archer. This is the original directory where um, I ran at the very start of this session. I ran a code on Archer to show you how it's done. Uh, if I remove LJ exercise log.ams, I put that. So I've got my executable here, my submission script. Let's change my submission script so that instead of running the module version of LAMPS on Archer, I run the version of LAMPS that I've just compiled. Uh, I hope this runs. We'll find out. Uh, let's do two birds with one stone as well and reduce that quartz to see whether the communication time does indeed reduce, because I've not actually tested that. It should do, but you know, one should never do these sorts of tests live. I hope this isn't going to come back to blow up in my face, but it might. Uh, so, tail up, da, 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 da. that's basically done. There we go. So, I run using, um, I run the exact same shell script, except instead of using the uh, LMP XE30 that comes from this module, I've just used the LMP that I compiled using CMake. Uh, and it seems to give a similar output. Let's have a quick look at the output, but yeah, you sort of have the same thing. You've got the same columns. You guys saw me deleting it, so it's clearly a new file. Uh, it seems to do the same thing. And let's have a wee look at that communication time. Yeah, there we go. So we had a communication time, which was about 41%, 42% of our total time. And here it's already 28%. So there is a nice, uh, we're not quite there yet, but there is a nice balancing act. You don't want too many processors for your job because you want your job to mainly spend its time calculating pair, um, you, you, you want uh, to spend most of your time calculating pair interactions, like pairwise interactions, i.e. all of your 
potential energies, all of your bond energies, all your angle energies, inter um, dihedral energies, all of that sort of thing is what you want to spend your time doing. You don't want to waste your time uh, doing communication. You also don't want to waste your time doing neighbors, uh, re-uploading, re-updating neighbors list. Like clearly here, my neighbors list um, delay is too small. Essentially, I should increase that because I'm wasting a lot of time rebuilding that. Um, yeah, so it runs, it works, um, and there you have a live example of how to compile LAMPs. Uh, so, moving on. So, we've done compiling LAMPs on Archer, and we've done it using make and cmake. So, the next thing we want to do is, well, actually, we've not compiled, we've compiled the very basic of LAMPs, but there's a bunch of packages. Um, and uh, LAMPS comes with a large number of packages, uh, some of which are standard packages, some of which are user-made packages, and which let you do a whole load of things. So you've got packages, like one of the packages is Asphere, which allows you to make um, to run aspherical uh, particles. One of them is Granular for granular systems. Anyone who's doing uh, discrete element methods will be using the Granular package. One of them is case space for long range in uh, Coulombic interactions. You will want a case space. One of them even lets you do Monte Carlo. I've never even had a look at that one. Molecule gives you a bunch of um, new force fields. There is a Python package, which I've described before. There is a rigid package for if you want to fix some of your bonds to be rigid. There is a Voronoi package for if you want to do Voronoi tessellation. There are also a series of user packages uh, the user packages uh, you can find there, and um, oh, sorry, the user packages you can find following the same link. You just click on a uh, user package instead of normal normal package, and those are essentially their packages created by LAMPS users that have been made available to the LAMPS community to allow you to run whatever code. Uh, there are a lot of them. There's one which allows you to run uh, plumbed or plumed or however that's pronounced. There's a couple of QMMM codes. Uh, I know that someone is working on linking CP2K to this. Um, yeah, there's a manifold one for surfaces. There's, uh, there's a user one for uh, modified uh, EAM potentials. Loads of stuff like that. Loads, loads, loads of stuff like that. And you can find out when, you know, you can find out more about this in, uh, like just by going on these uh, sites that I've given at the top. Uh, yeah, sorry, one second. But yeah, just by going on this, by going on this link, you should be able to find out about. You should be able to find the packages and find all about the packages. Uh, there are also a couple of more difficult packages, and we'll be talking of, about at least one of them. Uh, but these more difficult packages are packages that require something more to install them. Now, to install packages, uh, I will show you how to install packages using make before using CMake. Uh, to install packages or to add packages is relatively simple. Uh, I'm going to go into this directory uh, where I have a precompiled version of LAMPS because just to show you the make command, essentially I've precompiled LAMPS with the make command. Uh, the only difference between the make and the cmake command is that whereas in the cmake command you ended up with an executable called LMP, here you end up with an executable called LMP underscore whatever make file you used. In this case, I used the uh, makefile.xc30. If I used uh, makefile.mpi, so if I used make MPI rather than make xc30, uh, this would be LMP MPI. Um, yeah, so so I've made my um, I, I've I've made lamps in here, and I've got my executable, and everything's fine. And now, uh, one, once I've made lamps, if I were to type make xc30 again, it would just run really quickly because it's already made for a given definition of really quickly, unless I've done some weird changes since I started this. Uh, yeah, so it'll happily just make it again relatively quickly for, again, a, defin a given definition of relatively quickly, which might depend on how patient I am. Um, because you shouldn't be making anything at this point. 
Give it another five seconds. So yeah, that was longer than I wanted to spend. Um, so to make packages, um, first of all, you can find the list of all packages by typing make package status. And here it'll list all of the possible packages that you can uh, that you can uh, add in LAMPS. And you know, here's a sphere which I was talking about for sphericals. Uh, there's one for colloids. Here's granular, which I mentioned. Uh, the GPU package we will talk about briefly, though I will not compile it live. The K space uh, latte. There's an espresso. There's the Voronoi at the bottom, and then all of the user packages that you could you know possibly find on LAMPS. And uh, you have all of those, and you'll notice that for all of them, it's got installed, no, and then the name of the package. So let's say we want to make a spherical. How do we do that? Uh, we make, yes, a sphere. And now it's installing a sphere package. And if you make package status, they're all no, except right at the top, a sphere now says yes. Uh, the package is not technically installed. There, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, and if you want to unmake sphere, a sphere, you just make no. Uh, wait, what is it? Make by Yeah, so it's make no a sphere because I've got it twice. Make no a sphere. And it uninstalls the package, and that's done. Uh, so what do you, like it says installing, but it's not really installing the package. You've still got to recompile LAMPS after having made that package. So um, what happens when you're making this package? Well, I'm going to quickly look at this. And I'm going to quickly look at uh, specifically um, LL minus RT just to show in time what the last things are. Um, Let's move that here and make uh, so ll minus rt. I'm putting it into a file called ll old dot dat. There's a reason for that, which I'm sure some of you will have guessed. What happens uh, when you make a package? Well, basically, all that happens when you make a package is uh, lamps will, uh, or rather, the the make program, not lamps. The make program will. Uh, go into one of these many directories, and you'll notice that uh, we made a sphere. And look at that. There's a directory called a sphere here. I talked a couple of times about a directory called Voronoi, and hey, there's Voronoi. Uh, and if you go into those directories, LLA sphere, uh, you've got all of these compute commands, all of these fixes, all of these pair commands which are not currently in um, LAMPS, so for instance, uh, which are not currently in the main source directory. So, uh, so if I were to, in the source directory, look for pair uh, Gagarin, which is a, an aspherical thing, it's not there. It's an aspherical. But if I make a spherical and then look for Gagarin, Uh, you should be able to find one. There we go. It's now in the source file. Uh, did I mistype it originally? It looks like I might have. So it's there. It's there. Uh, let's quickly check that I didn't just mistype it by removing a sphere. Can't find it because it's not in the directory. Now, I've never tried this, but by basically what LAMPS does is um, when you make a package, I strongly suspect that uh, it just copies all of the files from within that package uh, directory and and just copies them. And as you saw, I made no package and then just copied the file. And there at the very top, it said make yes, it's a uh, base sphere. So, so essentially, you can cheat the system. You can use the make file if you want. You don't have to. You do what you want. It's, uh, it's up to you. But this is very useful for later on. Because basically, uh, when it comes to hacking lamps right here, what I'm trying to demonstrate is that 
the lumps uh, make file will make every uh, every C plus plus and every uh, like you know we'll we'll use all of the C plus plus and header files which are in the SRC directory so lump slash SRC in order to compile lumps and that'll be really super useful for when we get to actually writing our own code in lumps which we will do in a couple of slides uh, but yeah so so you make you, you, you make the packages by either using the make yes package name or by just copying everything from the directory into the source directory. And then once you've got all of the packages you want, you make, with XE30, I will remember that one day, you make with XE30 and it'll take its happy little time to do it. And while we're doing that, we'll just, while it's doing that, I will go back to the slide so that we can, um, that's it. So you install packages with make yes package, you uninstall with make no package name. And uh, then for uh, the CMake, uh, to, to make using CMake, you here in this bit here between, in this bit here between the CMake and the directory that you're CMaking, you add minus D package name, yes. So if I wanted to make it with A sphere, I would have minus D, A sphere equals yes. That's it. Uh, that's how you make. Very briefly, I'm aware that a few of you are interested in uh, compiling and running lamps on GPUs. Uh, lamps does have a GPU package. Lamps has a very good GPU package. Uh, The, um, what I'm using here is really how to compile, and it's a very brief overview of how to compile four GPUs uh, on a Linux system. But basically, you need to use the GPU package. So as before, instead of using make yes a sphere, you would use make yes GPU. But there's a couple of steps that you need to do before that. Uh, why would you want the GPU package? Well, it basically, it allows for pair, for pair style and long range electrostatics to be calculated much, much more quickly. GPUs, graphical processing units, are essentially, roughly speaking, you could think of them as, like, there are a bunch of very small, weak processors, but there's so many of them that you can run certain things really quickly. For large systems, for things that go for large distances, they can really speed up your system, the, your simulation runs. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, so you might want to run on GPUs. Lamps predominantly uses NVIDIA GPU drivers, which means like it, it runs using CUDA, basically, as far as I'm aware. Um, and if you're running using CUDA, like, you know, you probably need your NVIDIA GPU, so you need NVIDIA GPU and an NVIDIA GPU, and you need CUDA drivers installed as a prerequisite. Uh, and then to compile, like to be able to compile LAMPs with the GPU library, you first need to compile the GP, the GPU libraries. Um, and where do you do that? Let's swap back to shell where happily you will notice that um, there we go. I have recompiled lamps and it said that it's made an LMP XE30 and that it's recompiled and happy and should work and that it's exited. Uh, in terms of what it shows, let's move up a bit. Uh, where is it? It basically goes through and rebuilds all of the new packages. So fix the A sphere. Uh, it, it adds all of that to um, to the list of packages to be, and then it just compiles everything. Uh, one second, please. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so that's um, that's compiling with make. And now for the GPU libraries. Uh, to build the GPU libraries, I will not be doing this on Archer because Archer is a fully CPU um, uh, cluster. There are no GPUs on Archer, so there's no point in me doing this. But just to show you, in lib, for all of the 
uh, a couple of slides ago, I had uh, for difficult packages. You, uh, here's a list of like here's a link for where you can learn more about them to compile them. The quote unquote difficult packages are packages where essentially you'll need to build a library. So where do you find this library? Well, here I am in my main LAMPS directory. So if we look at my present working group directory, I'm in the pre-compiled LAMPS, just the head directory. There's my there's my source file. And instead of going to my source file before compiling, I go in lib. And here you'll see there's a library called GPU. And if one can type, one can go into that GPU library, and there's a bunch of stuff. There is a ton of stuff in that. Uh, am I in the right one? Right, I'm in the right one. And then from in here, you want to see make file, and specifically, uh, uh, now it kind of depends on what you're trying to compile, but basically, it, if you're trying, if you're wanting to compile on a Linux system, uh, you'll want makefile.linux. something, and I'll tell you something is in a sec. If you want to uh, compile on a Mac, I imagine you'd use this one here. Uh, there's a couple of other ones around, uh, but yeah. So I'm going to specifically look at the Linux systems. There's here a makefile.linux, just generally. There is a .linux .double, that is if you want to compile with double precision. Uh, why do they have this? A lot, this is more to do with uh, NVIDIA, uh, how it sells its GPUs than anything else, but basically NVIDIA tends to sell more expensive scientific GPUs that have very high double precision and much less expensive gaming GPUs that have the same processing power but at which they cap the amount, of, like the speed of double precision um, processing. Uh, quite often for molecular dynamics, you don't care too much about that eighth decimal place, which means that you can usually get away with using single precision. But if you've got a really good scientific GPU, you can use makefile.linux double, and even if you do, or otherwise you can use the dot single to allow you to run only single precision. Uh, mixed, I think, is a bit of double and single. Multi, I'm not too sure. OpenCL, I'm not too sure either. And there's a makefile.mac, which is probably for Macs. Um, in this makefile, you will need to change a couple of things. So I'm going to look at the single, because that is the one that I usually used when I, when I used to do this. Did I mistype something? Boom. There we go. Yes, I did. There we go. So uh, what do you have? It tells you to make makefile.lamps.standard. You always have to do that. It asks for the home of your CUDA directory. You always need to add the home of your CUDA directory. Usually it'll be installed. Maybe it isn't. If you have multiple CUDA directories and you want to use a specific version of CUDA, uh, this is where you specify that you maybe want CUDA 9 rather than CUDA 5.5 or whatever. Uh, the other thing that you might need to change is here, where it asks for the CUDA architecture. Uh, the CUDA architecture is basically asking how recent is your, G your GPU, how powerful is your GPU. And um, the rest of that you can usually just leave as is and make the library using the, I think it's just make. Uh, you might need to make Linux.single, maybe, but, but yeah, basically you just make it that way and that'll make your library. Uh, why would you want to... Uh, so, so how do you know what your CUDA architecture is? Uh, your CUDA architecture, um, this is a rough guide, but a friend of mine uh, has set up exactly what CUDA architecture different uh, GPUs have, and now you know what you should have as uh, SM underscore in the CUDA architecture and which version of CUDA you need minimum or maximum to run these. Uh, my friend has some quite old and much newer GPUs, so it gives you a lot of detail. And also, LAMPS uh, in the how to compile LAMPS, uh, LAMPS libraries for GPUs or GPU libraries for LAMPS, um, it tells you where you can find all of that for any GPU. But this is just a rough guide. If you know roughly, you know, if your GPU is one of these, or if you know roughly what your GPU is equivalent to on this list, here's a rough guide of exactly what you need to run. Uh, lamps with it. Uh, yes, and then to make it, uh, here it is, you 
uh, make five, uh, you make minus j n, where n is the number of pro processors in your machine, and minus f because you want to use this make file rather than another, and then it'll sort of like compile the library, and only then can you go back into the lamp source directory. And um, at this point, you sometimes you quite often need to recompile all of your packages, so you make no all and then make yes all of the packages you need. And uh, you will also need to include the uh, GPU package. So that's compiling lamps for GPU. It's a very brief overview, but I hope this was enough. Uh, carrying on, finally we get to uh, the thing that probably most of you are interested in, which is how do you alter source codes on lamps? Uh, Always a bit disconcerting when you say that and someone leaves immediately. Uh, this is this is very close to the end of our session. Uh, our session, uh, in terms of like it'll probably take the next thirty odd minutes to do this. But to compile, um, so how do you how do you hack labs basically is what I'm going to be teaching for the rest of this session. Uh, I will be doing most of this in shell because that makes sense. Uh, so. I am in the GPU library lib. So most programs in LAMPS get changed in a very similar way. Um, and uh, the very first thing that I want to say is don't just change a program without having saved a backup. So always backup before you alter things, because otherwise things will go horribly messy. We'll get horribly, uh, horribly messy. Uh, but let's have a look at some LAMPS input scripts. And let's look at the simple um, pair style that we've been using, which is pair, lj, cut. And there's two files. There's a header file and a C++ file. So let's look at the header file, and in the header file, you are just essentially you're defining the um, uh, what is it? You're you're essentially defining the the class that you're using. And essentially, you've got here you've got a class called pair lj cut, and in that class, you're doing you've got all of these commands that are associated with that class that can be called by the general LAMPS program if this is compiled with it. Uh, and you've got things like uh, compute. So whenever you need to compute the energy using parallel J cut, it will call this com uh, parallel J cut compute. Uh, you've got init style, which is when you're initializing uh, your parallel J cut, this is what's getting called. You've got how to write a restart file. Uh, if you're running particularly long jobs, I think I very briefly mentioned this last time. If you're running particularly long jobs, you can write a restart file at the end of a job and restart using said restart file so that you don't need to run the entire calibration again, for instance, or whatever. Uh, you've got read restart so that you can reread that restart file. You can, uh, you've got settings for it, write data for, uh, this is to allow you to write, um, this just allows you to write things like, uh, uh, from memory, it's, uh, it's things like pressures, energies, all those sorts of things. Uh, if you're running it in single variable, and then there's a couple of other bits. And here at the end, it tells you all of the protected variables, the variables you need to have defined in order to run this uh, this style. And it tells you here that you need a cutoff for every atom type, and you have no idea how many atom types you'll have at the start. And for every pair, you will need an epsilon. For every pair, you will need a sigma. For every pair, you will need all of those things. And then at the bottom, it tells you all of the errors that you can have and what they might be. So that's your header file. And uh, the C++ file is the much more interesting um, code, which tells you all of the libraries you need to include. First off, is always, it asks you to include the header file. Then other than that, it sort of tells you, so here, um, where is it? Make sure to reallocate your memory. And then here we have the compute. And in the compute, it'll say, here's how you're computing. Uh, you're starting at a variable i going from 0 to the max number. And you're setting a temporary x, y, z 
uh, position based on that position of particle i. And then you define you find the particle j, which is in the neighbor list, and you count how many particles are in the neighbor list, and then for every particle within that neighbor list, you do whatever's here. And what do you do here? Well, you mainly you find the distance between the two particles, you square that distance, and then if that square distance is less than the squared cutoff for your LJ cutoff interruption, you calculate the energy. And here's how you calculate your energy, and you also calculate your force. Uh, both are important. Uh, where am I? Yep. So, uh, F bears your force, and then E van der Waal here is your energy. And it just, you, you know, and this is just how you how you calculate uh, your energy per particle, and then it can even give you at the end the total energy uh, of the system. Um, that's essentially, this is the bit that's called every single time step for every single pair of particles or every single pair of particles within a neighbor list. Uh, this is usually the first bit that you vary if you want to change the potential. Uh, then there's a bunch of other things uh, that you'd also probably want to vary as well in case. Yeah. So, uh, enough just talking about this. Let's very quickly see how, how do we alter this. So I'm going to take this pair LJ cut. Uh, and I am essentially, first off, I'm going to copy it to make my own style. And we'll call it uh, pair LJ test. I tend to like to have uppercase names for my files as opposed to the lamp files, which are all lowercase, just so that they stand out when I need to look for them. Uh, but that's just a personal preference. I could have called it Jerry if I'd wanted. Uh, I don't know why Jerry is always my go-to name, but it is. So same with the C++ file. And the first thing we need to do is um, the, the other advantage of doing uppercase is that you get to your files much quicker much more quickly. Uh, the first thing we need to do is uh, we need to change the style command. This is true of every single thing. I'll show you a couple of fixes in a sec. But here we have the pair style. And it says pair style lj slash cut and pair lj cut. Um, this defines how LAMPS calls this style. So uh, if we look back at our If we look back at our input script, uh, where I define my pair style, I use lj bash. So this defines what our pair style is. So if I want to change this, uh, I'd need to change the name for that. Otherwise, there would be two. Um, otherwise, at the moment, if I were to compile this code, there would be two different. Um, or one single command, lj slash cut, would call two different force pair interactions. That would cause a crash. Indeed, I don't think it would compile. It, it, it wouldn't. So let's call it test instead and change test. Uh, very briefly, I forgot to mention, here this set pair, uh, pair lj cut to start off with. This is also possible. Like Instead of doing lj cut, you could use pair lj cut to call this command in a LAMP script as well. It works perfectly fine. It's just longer and not uh, written on the website. Uh, cool. Then if and if, then define this. Uh, this is telling you uh, that this is the part that you need to define. We want a different name for this. Otherwise, this just will assume. Otherwise, LAMPS will assume that this is already compiled when we call it, even if it isn't compiled. And then the last bit is uh, we want to change all of those uh, all of those pair LJ cuts to pair LJ test. Um, I'm just going to do this quickly because uh, I forgot to.
I forgot the colon. I will get there eventually. There we go. And now all the places where it used to say parallel J cut, it now says parallel J test. There is one, two, and there's a third occurrence of it somewhere, which I can't find. There it is. Three, which have been changed. Uh, and that's how you change your, your header file. Now, at this point, I've not changed anything in terms of what I'm calculating, how I'm calculating things, or anything like that. I just changed the name of the header file. So save and look at the C++ file. First thing to change in the C++ file is this bit of code. Actually, before I do this, uh, I wanted to show very quickly that uh, for a fix, I don't know, what did we use? NVT dot H, you have, again, a fix style, and you would need to change that name. So in the slides where it says change the style name, that's what I mean. And then you need to change this, and you'd also need to change every instance of this. Uh, this is true for a compute style as well. I don't know. This is true for the balance command, which we talked about earlier. Uh, why am I looking at the C++? This is the H file, which I'm looking at. So yeah, again, you've got your command style and your this, which you need to change so that you, you can uh, call you can define all of the classes, all of the variables you need for your new um, command, and then you need to change your class name. That's that. So back to changing our test. The first thing we need to change is this uh, header file, because at the moment it's calling the wrong header file, and that's not a good thing. Next. We've got a bunch of references to pair LJ cuts, which again we want to. Uh, I did that. Uh, which we again want to um, change. So to change them, um, same command as before. I'm just replacing thing in, things in BIM at the moment. Uh, it's not particularly exciting, I'm aware. Uh, boom. There we go, they're all changed. So all 21 um, calls to pair LJ cut have been changed to pair LJ test. And at this point, I have changed everything in my uh, file. Uh, and I now have a new pair style called pair LJ test, which I could call, which I could. Um, Cool. So at this point, I've added a new pair style called pair LJ test. I've done nothing so far other than changing names. We'll get into the other things we can do in a sec, but let's just check that I've not completely screwed up by checking that we can still make this file. Uh, while this is compiling in the background, I will quickly go on to uh, the penultimate slide. Actually, this seems to be working. Uh, let's stay on this slide then. So there, it's reworking the bits of lumps it needs to change. Give it another two seconds. If it takes too long, I'll probably just swap to Here we go. So that last bit there, it was looking at the files that have changed since the last time it compiled. And one of those is there is a new file called pair LJ test. And now it's just compiling the executable. There have been no errors so far. So unless I'm mistaken, there we go. It finishes. And we have a new executable, which has also our new command pair LJ test. And if you remember, which I don't, uh, We can call this command by using pair, pair style lj test. So let's copy this executable. Um, 
to here and call it LMP test. CI indult LJ and where is it? Here. Not to test. So far they're exactly the same. Like LJ cut and LJ test are exactly the same. I'm just showing you that I'm able to call the same thing with a different name because of the things I've changed uh, to the files. Um, let's run the LJ exercise and output and log. Uh, change that to LMP test. And now if we use the lamps, it's queuing, it's running, and it's running exactly as it was before, doing exactly the same stuff as it was before, because so far all I've done is I've copied one hairstyle into a new folder and renamed it. That's all I've done, but this is a good first step, because now we can get to the fun part, which is actually starting to change our potential. Uh, so if we go back, Now, all of the work we need to do is in the C++ file unless we want to add new variables that we need to call, uh, which I'm not going to show how to do just yet. So yeah, so at the moment we've got everything and it's being calculated and it's calculating the pair style. And at this point, it really is a case of just changing the right bits of codes to get the answer you want. So um, for instance, at the moment, the thing that's being calculated for the forces is this thing called Force LJ, which is R6 inverse. R6 inverse is uh, it's 1 over R squared cubed, so 1 over R to the 6, times the Leonard Jones uh, sigma of uh, the type of particle 1 and the type of particle 2, uh, times R, and then minus. Uh, minus uh, the, yeah, minus that. Uh, let me think, what am I looking at? That's minus the uh, shift if you have a shift. Uh, so what you're doing here is you've got your uh, LJ1 is your 1 over R uh, to the 12, and your LJ2 is your 1 over R to the 6 term. And uh, you essentially, instead of using the 4 epsilon times 1 over r to the 12 minus 1 over r to the 6. This is using a a over r to the 12 minus b over r to the 6 uh, style Leonard Jones code, where a and b are calculated from the epsilons and the sigmas that you provide in the code. Uh, so let's say, for instance, that instead of having a Leonard Jones attractive system, uh, we like a pure Leonard Jones system, we could, for instance, just get rid of this. And this would make um, a, this would make all of our interactions be, consider only the one of R to the 12 term. So I'm currently changing the code in order to, um, to do a potential which is uh, equal to four epsilon times sigma over R to the 12. Uh, i.e. just the repulsive part of a Leonard Jones potential, i.e. just a power of 12 repulsion. Uh, at this point, I need to just get rid of all of those instances of LJ. Uh, yep, uh, of LJ2 or LJ3. So, sorry, LJ2 or LJ4. So here you, you'll see that there's a couple of occurrences of this. Another occurrence that you'll get of this is in um, the compute inner, outer, and middle. But again, just getting rid of these. Um, Most 
exciting thing to see, but it's just just to emphasize that I am able to keep the thing, uh, that I am able to alter the code to do stuff that it wasn't previously able to do. Uh, I'm going to keep this because this is a memory call, and we might as well save that for later. It saves us having to delve too much into the header file, and I should be able to that way finish everything I need here. It shows you how uh, LJ1 and LJ2, which are the force uh, coefficients that you need for your Leonard Jones potential, and then LJ3, LJ4, which are the energy coefficients, are calculated. Again, don't care too much about those. Uh, don't care. This bit is telling you that if you've got a pair of particles i and j, then uh, it doesn't matter whether you've got pair i and j or pair j and i, they both have the same um, LJ forces. That's just to speed things up. Uh, this bit we're getting rid of. That one can stay, that one can stay, that one can stay, that one can stay. There we go. So we've done all of our LJ2s, so now let's do our LJ4s. That one can stay, that one can stay. That one can go. Sorry. Stays, goes. Stays, stays. Cool. So with that, we've uh, altered the code. It is now no longer doing the same Leonard Jones calculation as it was before. It is now doing a uh, just a pure repulsion uh, where as the distance between two particles gets less than um, the radius of the particles, uh, the force that the particles will feel will increase to the power of 12. It is an enormous force increase, which means that half of our systems will likely crash, but we're just I'm just doing this to show you that I can still compile the system. And if I've not made any mistakes, this will hopefully compile. Again, this will take a sec. Uh, but you guys have seen how it compiles before, and I'm not exactly going to hide that it doesn't, because I'm kind of honest about these things. Uh, very quickly, while it compiles in the background, uh, let's go back to the slides so that I can show you uh, the penultimate slide, which is a bunch of useful links. If you want to start modifying LAMPs, if you want to start adding your own code, hacking certain pair styles, things like that, um, then uh, these are uh, these are two websites where you can find everything that you like more than everything you could ever want to know about this. It'll go into much more detail than I'm currently going into, but you know, kind of useful for you. I've gotten a question, which is um, where is it? Someone is slightly confused between the uh, about the difference between the source code and the input file. So uh, the input file is where you give all of the commands that you are going to tell your LAMPS executable to run. So it's where you tell LAMPS, well, I'm, uh, you've got your LAMPS executable, which in our case is called lmp underscore xc30. Uh, you've got your LAMPS executable, and the input file you feed into that LAMPS executable, and you tell it, well, I'm going to have a 1,000 particles, and they're going to have Leonard Jones interactions, and they're going to be at this temperature, they're going to have this time step, run for this many time steps, and all of that information, that's an input file. The LAMP source code is the actual programming code that uh, you use to compile the LAMPS executable that will run your input scripts. So it's essentially, it's essentially LAMPS MD script. It's open access, anyone can alter it. Uh, not everyone can then upload it for, the, you know, usually, you, that there are some um, restrictions as to the use of it, so you can't exactly make money off of it without paying some form of royalty to Sandia, but um, uh, Sandia National Labs, which are the people who make labs. But but basically, anyone can uh, can change the the can change the source code to change the way the lamps executables run. And what we're doing at the moment is we are changing the source codes to change our lamps executables so that it will have new functions, new a, a new pair style in this case called pair style LJ slash test, which it didn't have before, and that pair style will act differently, hopefully, from every other pair style before. Uh, does that make sense? Cool. Uh, so all of that information you can find here. Uh, it's useful links for developers. And uh, yeah, it's in the slides. The slides that you can get, uh, there's multiple places you can get the slides. You can get them on, on the 
uh, Archer training webpage, which I'm just going to put a link to that in the chat. Uh, you can also get this uh, just on Archer. Uh, I'll show you where in a sec. And uh, yeah, if you email me, I'm more than happy to pass these things on. Uh, yeah, so with that, let's move back to this is really just the final bit, like, you know, final bit of the session just to show you the code has compiled. Uh, where is it? Yeah, the code has compiled and uh, it has, LAMPS has noticed that I have made alterations to test to pair LJ test and has recompiled it without really bothering too much about the rest of the stuff because it's already there, which means that the second compilation is always faster than the first. And now I have my new ops uh, executable. So let's again copy our executable into our test directory and call it LMP test. Uh, yeah. Let's call it, uh, yeah, yeah, screw it. Let's call it LMP test. And then we will go into this directory. Uh, I'm going to move uh, the log file to, to a backup and otherwise remove output and LJ files. And the reason I'm moving my log file is because now if this job runs, it might not because I've changed the interparticle pair style in such a way that the system might now just explode. I don't know yet. I've never tried running this. This is live experiments. Um, but if this runs, uh, I would expect the output file or the log files to be different for both systems. It's running. That's always good. And it's run without crashing. Hurrah. Uh, so very quickly, I'm going to look at log.lamps. And I think we should find, if I've not been too silly about this. There we go. If we look, one, two, three. If we look at the fourth column, again, I've not tested this. This is live, right? Uh, if it doesn't work, I apologize. But if we look at the fourth column, uh, this column, uh, those numbers show the potential energy. Those numbers show the pairwise interactions. And if what I did wasn't completely wrong, then these numbers should be relatively different from the numbers in the new file. They might not be. I might have messed up. I'm sorry if I messed up, but I don't think I did. Um, We'll find out in a sec. I mean, it's the easiest way to do it. But roughly speaking, we've got here numbers that are around 2 to 2.32. Uh, in our new, in our old log file, backup.log.lamps, that second column had values. Oh, perfect. Uh, the potential energy was negative. And that's because we have an attractive term. So if you look here, we've got values which are around minus 3 to minus 4. Um, and uh, those values are negative. And the reason that those values are negative, whereas our new code is positive, is because I have removed all of the attractive interactions in uh, the Leonard Jones cutoff file. So I have been able to alter this code and get a different answer. Um, uh, hopefully, this helps you guys understand how you can hack LAMPS, how you can change in LAMPS, things in LAMPS. I know it's a very brief overview, but I hope that's been helpful. Uh, I just want to end with, I've got two quick slides to get through and then we'll be done. And there is no question that we'll finish on time, uh, that we will definitely finish on time. Uh, the first slide I want to talk about is some of you might want a certificate of attendance uh, to, show, to show that you've attended this course. Uh, I know that it's a requirement for certain, um, for certain PhD programs and stuff like that. If you want a certificate of attendance, there is a very small exercise that I'd like you to do, which you should all be able to do relatively uh, hopefully not, hopefully relatively easily. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me with questions.
questions. I mean, I'm always happy to clarify things. But all I want you to do is uh, I've added in the day two materials and on the course website, I've added a script called in.leonardjones.certification. This is where you can find it. Uh, it's exactly the same script as the in.leonardjones that we've just been running for the entire course. And uh, basically, the code we've run has had a fixed particle number, volume, and temperature. And I'd like you all to um, essentially just, just alter it. It should be, you should be able to alter it in about three steps. Uh, and just alter it to make it into a fixed particle number, pressure, and temperature. And if you could email the log file that you get from that job after you've run it and tested it to training at ebcc uh, uh, we will be happy to send you back a certificate of attendance provided that you show that you understand what you're doing. With that, uh, I want to thank all of you for your time, for listening to me for the last two hours and two hours again a week ago. I also really want to thank Claire, who you've just heard, who frankly, she runs everything. I'm only here talking to you guys because she sorts everything out in the background. I also really want to give a thanks to uh, Rui Apostolo, who um, gave me a lot of input about pro post-processing software and the entire bit on compiling maps on GPUs. I've not done that in about three or four years. And essentially, I just emailed him this morning and said, how do you do it, help? And he replied. And lastly, I also want to give a quick shout out to Ranga and Yang, who also gave me a lot of input for um, post-processing software. I hope you all have a good day and I hope you found the course interesting.